we are live. So um, I'll promise not to swear. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, welcome everyone to our uh, deep learning deep learning academy academia panel. Um, our four panelists. So myself, I'm the moderator, John Butler. I'm based in Ireland, TU Dublin. I'm a mathematician and a computational neuroscientist. Uh, the other panelists are Alice Bramford, uh, Dania Jissett, Amita Kapoor, and Andrew Sachs. Uh, and I'm first going to get them to introduce themselves and talk a bit about how they end up where they are. And uh, I was just saying that it'd be great to even hear the earliest part. So once again, myself, I started in the role to become an academia because I had a parent who was a teacher. And it always seemed like a nice thing. And I quite like maths. And on some level, I, I kind of fell into it uh, because of that. But um, that's what started me on the road uh, towards it. Also, um, I was very bad at everything except maths and computing. So it seemed like the right place for me to go. Uh, so first, uh, to my uh, right, I'll ask Alex. Can you introduce us and say a bit about yep. how you got so, to where you are? All right. So hi, everyone. So. So I'm currently a group leader at INRIA, which is a French national institute focused on uh, computer science and uh, applied mathematics. Um, and my group is working at the intersection between machine learning and, and neuroscience and neuroimaging. And so I did my undergrad uh, studying applied math in, uh, in Paris in a school called Ecole Polytechnique. Then I did my uh, master's degree in uh, machine learning and computer vision. I was mostly interested in image processing and uh, started to do my few first few internship on, on medical imaging and, and then i was looking for a phd project and uh, ended up working on eeg and meg and and, and um, basically brain electrophysiological signals and working on inverse problems the statistical estimation so it ended up being more more and more signal processing and 12 years ago i started a postdoc in the team and we started to do more machine learning, uh, mostly at the beginning on fMRI. And we started a project that some of you may know, which is the scikit-learn software. So I started the scikit-learn software with a bunch of other people in, in Paris, France in 2010. Um, and so this is how my research drifted more and more towards more machine learning. And um, now uh, you know, I'm at INRIA since 2017. Uh, and I would say I started to work on deep learning pretty much at that time, uh, mostly with applications on, on brain signals uh, like EEG and MEG and decoding and, and these types of uh, downstream applications. Uh, just, it's just because it's probably going to come again and again, but did you have, every, at every point, did you have a five-year plan or was it just uh, something you enjoyed? Because this is what, like, I'm always amazed by people who have plans. <laughs> um, <laughs> don't think there was any plan, but it's true that pretty much every five years I've, I've moved and, and done something else. Uh, I don't know if, if it's my internal clock <laughs> that is ticking, but um, yeah, so there was nothing really planned, uh, but I tried every time to have some kind of soft transition. So, so uh, next, uh, Genia, could you talk a bit about your path to where you are? Right. So um, um, I'm currently uh, a lab leader at Uli Supercomputing Center, which is one of the institutes in uh, Helmholtz Research Center located in Uli. Uh, that is a village close to uh, Cologne, Köln, which is maybe a city some people have heard ever about. Um, so uh, there currently I'm focusing on a basic question, what makes learning algorithms um, generalize well across domains and tasks. So what produces transferable learning? Um, and uh, specifically um, uh, with a question, what uh, the scale of training, so network size, data size, and compute um, invested in uh, training uh, may have to do with achieving strong generalization of those uh, pre-trained models if you transfer them. Um, so my path, uh, yeah, started obviously quite early on where I realized that I um, fancy uh, uh, natural science in general, uh, specifically then um, uh, 
find computers kind of curious and I dealt with computers uh, since I was 10, 11, uh, uh, pretty much. Um, so it was my playground for trying out things um, from early childhood. Um, and then I was uh, at some point confronted with uh, the decision to go to physics or to computer science. And it was quite a, yeah, a symmetry breaking uh, event, uh, more, uh, yeah, not really a backed up decision, but I went to computer science, um, did a uh, master's together though with psychology, with biopsychology, which made me also move uh, to neural networks um, quite early on uh, during my undergraduate. So and since then I was dealing with neural networks a lot with all different kinds of um, uh, very exotic ones, uh, that probably are completely vanished by now, um, uh, classical ones. So uh, something in between like winner take all uh, uh, dynamics networks and such. So in a, um, I played with multi-layer networks uh, since since masters. Um, also doing PhD on um, uh, uh, on unsupervised learning in visual cortex it, using uh, uh, kind of a population rate model that was uh, uh, not too far off back then, uh, winner take all dynamics actually. And was doing this kind of things always in parallel. So computational neuroscience, on the one hand, trying to, to 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 at least do some parallels to how it may be implemented in neural substrate, and machine learning part where it was yeah, then abstracting away all the um, bio details and trying to make um, the algorithm work um, um, on the level of state of the art uh, back then. So and this is how I uh, indeed then um, uh, converged to. Uh, whatever became out of a deep learning i mean we was we were doing it in some of the other fashion uh, back then people were trying also to hijack gpus already quite early on 2006 2007 in the lab where i was doing phd uh, for speeding up uh, conventional well also convolutional neural nets um uh, and then um, it was a quite um, uh, um a smooth transition for me so and then the recent time, um, so I went through many research organizations, Max Planck in Germany, um, then Helmholtz again in Germany. So I'm, I have a very biased German view on, on, on academia. Um, and um, so at some point, uh, this uh, um, uh, direction popped up that is maybe terms nowadays scaling laws, where it is about uh, studying uh, really large uh, networks. Uh, on the large data amounts and see whether there are emergent functionalities that you wouldn't expect um, from a quite simple uh, training procedure and simple laws that you plug in. <laughs> so my story so far. Actually, and I'm going to come back to this later, is it, uh, I know this, we're meant to be talking about deep learning, but it feels more and more that deep learning or maybe neural net specific diverged a long time ago from neuroscience, but in the more recent past, and that's bringing an Andrew now, in the more recent papers, I'm seeing that neural nets not, aren't just for analysis, but also can help us understand more and more about uh, neuroscience. So I, I, I think the next five or 10 years, uh, there's going to be this kind of weird, we're going to be examining neural nets like we examine uh, rodents and so forth or uh, monkeys to understand. I've seen some lovely papers about multi-sensor integration showing different things. But anyway, that's inside, but just the future. And that leads us to Andrew. Uh, Andrew, can you tell us a bit about yourself? And yeah, uh, I completely agree with that vision of, you know, deep networks eventually telling us things about neuroscience, perhaps. Um, so I'm uh, a group leader at the Gatsby Computational Neuroscience Unit in London, and also the Sainsbury Welcome Center, which is a uh, experimental neuroscience unit. And um, my path to academia, I started off in electrical engineering. And uh, in fact, also my PhD is in electrical engineering. And I guess I'm interested in machine learning, so I, maybe that makes sense, but I'm also very interested in neuroscience and there's just, it's difficult to find your way into theoretical neuroscience. You can't study it usually as an undergrad. So I was just kind of wandering around, happened uh, the electrical engineering department. And I guess our trajectories are always a mixture of uh, chance and planning. Um, but for me, the chance was really encountering 
uh, some professors in undergrad, uh, Ken Norman of Princeton and John Cohen and um, some others who just, I, I was, I was going to be an engineer working on robotics and then I took these neuroscience classes and it just grabbed me. Um, and then I've been switching over uh, ever since. Um, and I guess, um, yeah, maybe, maybe that's all to say. Um, but I guess from my perspective, you know, exactly what you studied or what label is um, seems to fall away once you focus on the question you're most interested in. Uh, and then it's just, you know, whatever you can do to gain some insight into that. No, I, I couldn't agree more that, and it will come up when we get to address some of the questions, the randomness of how some things happen in your career and how you meet people is so important. The, the one thing is, and I, I think it'll be consistent by everyone, and I've seen that none of us have what would be classic neuroscience, like I'm a mathematician. The only issue is sometimes, and I found this in Ireland and other countries are different. In Ireland, I'm only allowed to teach maths. Uh, only maths, you, only in school of maths will take me because I have a PhD in maths, even though uh, I have 10, 15 years of neuroscience research, I am a mathematician. So there is sometimes a weirdness about that that happens. But I found uh, in my school of maths, for example, I can teach everything they're happy with me, but they're actually more delighted that I'm multidisciplinary. And that's something I've found over the last while is that that word isn't just a bad word. It's actually a word that is good because a long time it, for a long time, it's actually been a bit of a, it can be a crutch. Now uh, over to Amita and uh, can you tell us a bit about your journey? Yeah, thanks, John. Uh, so uh, I would start my journey from probably my undergraduate level where I first learned about neural networks. So that was basically a time when I was reading about neural networks and reading a lot and lot about even SMOF. So both of them, you know, kind of side by side made my interest into this particular field. And in my master's also, I continued into artificial intelligence, although my degree was electronics, but undergrad, it means neural networks was one of my subjects. And we were also doing programming in Fortran and everything. So I was also working with all, you know, classical neural networks, art and uh, winner take all algorithms and all that stuff. And then uh, after my master's, I like in, in India, we have an exam called as net exam, which is necessary if you want to go for teaching. So I appeared for that exam and I cleared it. And uh, as a result, I got into teaching. And since then I was in college uh, teaching and it's still 2020, I have continued my teaching in teaching different subjects from artificial intelligence to neural networks, to even robotics and all that stuff. And then 2020, I decided to take a uh, leave from the teaching job. And right now I'm a freelance AI consultant. Actually, before we start addressing some of the questions, I think is um, I am what would be uh, the Americans would term it kind of a teaching college. I, I have a lot of teaching load, but it's a question for yourselves. Do you have much teaching in your, in your current positions? And um, it kind of leads into, did you do any teaching experience in your undergraduate or PhD days? So it kind of leads into what skill sets. So I'll go around in the same kind of order because I may as well go geography. Uh, Alex, what about yourself? Do you have much teaching? Or yeah, I've been doing a, a, a lot of teaching. Uh, I mean, a lot depends on your baseline level, but uh, yeah. I, I was, I mean, before joining Henry, I was a sleep professor. So I, I was always teaching probably close to 200 hours a year to undergrad students teaching signal processing, um, intro to optimization, uh, um, like hands-on machine learning. Uh, and, and just out of curiosity, like, had you, and this is one thing, had you any training in teaching before, like had, during your PhD? <laughs> uh, like most teachers, I'm a self-taught teacher. <laughs> yeah, no, it, 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 it's just, it come, kind of comes what skills. It's that thing is in academia, uh, is teaching as a skill isn't respected, but teaching experience is useful. Uh, well, what you see is when you went to apply for assistant professor position, they would typically ask you to give a talk or to present some kind of scientific material. 
and they would quickly evaluate how much you like explaining what you're doing and how likely you are to become a good teacher. Uh, so it's more like this, that is actually how the, the system selects like teachers like this. At least that's my experience, like especially hiring a few younger professors back in the days and even now participating to evaluation panels this ability to to present science and and to to be enthusiastic about what you're presenting is critical for for landing in a teaching job uh, and just because it kind of it, i would say i it might not seem me but that kind of skill set is becoming more and more essential and that's one thing that if you're a phd student don't teach too much but do some teaching uh, it's a line in your cv which seems very harsh but also if you're going to become a uh if you want to stay in academia find out if you like teaching early because a lot of jobs have teaching and if you don't like teaching it's then i have some colleagues in my department who don't like teaching but that's their job and they are not happy people uh well, what about eugenia I, I found in germany they normally keep it separate if you're in a research institute you just do it voluntarily but maybe it's different in yours definitely in the max bank it was but in, in france i mean where i'm where i'm right now is also a, a pure research uh institute like max Planck, if you want uh so mm -hmm. in Ria is really this this place where if you don't want to teach anything you, you don't but now the reality is a lot of us are actually teaching and probably i would say these days i could I still pretty much teach up to 100 hours but but mostly at the master's level uh, yeah, uh, yeah so like uh, teaching machine learning and advanced optimization to like what would be like the the, the master's degree and what about you Jania? do you do some teaching at all i know it seems kind of off, but it's actually for me anyway my side it's one of the fundamental skills that's talked less about along the way <laughs> Oh. We cannot hear you. No. Okay, so now no, no, I, no, no. I muted myself. Uh, right. So how, I mean, in Germany, you mentioned German situation. It it is similar to what Alex was mentioning about uh, Inria as a state research facility. So you have either universities where you have in Germany uh, a teaching load that is too high, in my opinion, at least. So people cannot really do much research. Um, with that load and then you have uh, research facilities from Max Planck, Helmholtz, uh, Fraunhofer or Leibniz uh, where you have uh, less teaching demand or even known like Alex was stating if you uh, try to uh, screen yourself from it. So in my case I was indeed doing um, so my path went through Max Planck and Helmholtz where teaching demand is not um, high or not necessary at all if you don't want to. Uh, but I was teaching sporadically at different workshops, uh, different lecture series. Um, I was not having a regular teaching duty, though, as it would be a case in university. Uh, so I was also going abroad to teach. Um, so like going for kind of um, initiation or support events, uh, say, in Ukraine, in Kiev back in 2015. So this kind of things I was um, trying to involve myself to, to, to get students also uh, uh, there somewhat on the recent track uh, and also for purely egoistical reasons because uh, in East Europe you have a strong studentship and you can advertise your lab and then uh, get really nice uh, students um, to work with you and so just the, yeah but that's the, that's the thing is now I teaching for me and I know for a lot of people is how and some of the how, how do you meet a supervisor it's generally a lecturer early on and that it's the question goes the other way is how do I meet students is by teaching so that's another way within your own institution is go to the people who you enjoy the lecture of and ask them that's how you step in the right direction like a lot of reasons if um like when I was in the Max Planck I used to teach in the in University of Tubingen and so I could meet students and vice versa if someone's down there teaching they're the people who should be approaching because you have a connection with them they might not want to supervise you but they'll know people those kind of connections early on are so fundamental, I think. So that's the other reason why I wanted to raise by teaching is those kind of introductions to people, you'd be surprised. Um, if I meet a student who I think is good, I'll promote that student to someone looking for a PhD position. Those small connections early on really matter, um, especially when you're an undergraduate. 
uh, that's how you like there's a bit of randomness to it. Uh, what about you, Andrew? Uh, you're Gatsby, aren't you? Yeah, um, I don't. So I think this is unusual, for me, but I, I don't have I have four hours of teaching a year, which is very little. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, Four hours. No. <laughs> it's actually too little. I think you know we all make contributions to research in different ways. One of them is through writing papers, but the other is through bu building the next generation of researchers. And in my view, this is one of the joys of academia. It's like one of the key roots of impact in academia. Um, and if you think of the long-term health of how do we support research over many, many years into the future, the only way is through teaching and hopefully inspired teaching, uh, not just indifferent teaching. Um, and uh, I do enjoy it. And I think I probably should do more of it. Um, and it seems like the options in the UK are sort of too little or too much. <laughs> so, uh, you know, hopefully we can find a balance. And the other thing, you know, I, there's lots of reasons to do this to help the research community and other people, but I, I benefited from this. This is what let me come into this field. And so I feel like um, doing that for others is is valuable. And when you teach, you also learn. So I've, you know, the, the times I have taught, I, it's, it's refined my understanding so much. So I do find it uh, very valuable. Well, and um, once again, it's kind of, it, it, I'm using this as a gateway to kind of a career in academia has many facets. And this is one of them. And Amita, you, you, you like me, it sounds like had a heavy teaching load, but um, uh, how, how do you have to train in teaching? And do you think, like actually in the more general, and I'll ask you, when applying for PhD positions and then further on postdocs, do you think teaching is beneficial? Having some teaching experience or things like that. Are you asking me? Uh, well, you can start Andrew and then it will go to me. Yeah, since you were. Uh, yeah, yeah, so I guess, um, I think the truth is most hiring decisions are made not really considering teaching um, at the moment. And I, I think, that, that's been my observation. I'm not saying it should be that way, but, but that's my observation. Uh, Anamita, yourself? Yeah, can you please repeat the question? There was a break in between. Oh, yeah. No, so I was just wondering, like, your, uh, um, uh, your experience is teaching, like, is it been fundamental to your career? And, uh, like, kind of how... It, okay, how yeah, it it definitely. It's like when... When I started teaching, I was taking more than 36 hours per week of teaching load. And by the time I was like in the my in my senior most position in the uh, like 2020s, I was taking about 12 hours per week of teaching, direct teaching load. So it had been very much part of, you know, the whole thing. And when you start, even in it means in India, the rules are such like that, that you have to do a lot of teaching when you are at the junior position. And as you become senior, the load becomes less. So yes, it is very much integral part and it is needed means like you get a lot of interaction. And as Andrew said, definitely you learn a lot when you teach. So that is definitely there. And at the same time, yes, you get an interaction with the students. So like, you know, you can choose them when you are taking up PhD students or when you're taking them for internship or training and even for job appointments. Sometimes you do have a preference for the people, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And this kind of, so I'm going to go to the question and answer thing. This kind of goes along with that. Uh, uh, Sarah was asking, how do you get the professor's attention for uh, MSPHE positions? And how should we prepare ourselves before approaching these questions? They kind of, in two things that, so I was going to, like as I said, approaching the people who teach you is the first step in my mind. They might have connections, but yourselves, like how have you been finding, specific DL, I wonder it's a harder and harder to get PhDs and so forth. Are you like, as people recruiting, have you had trouble over the last while? Once again, I'll just go in the same order. Uh, I starting with you, Alex. Yeah. So I mean, what I when I teach and I tell this this, this my student every time is like in French. I think there's I think it's a, a French bad habit. I don't know how it is for you in different countries, but typically in the U.S. it's very different. Where uh, students they don't uh, communicate or interact too much with their professors. They are very neutral and uh, during during the classes and they are not really aiming to start like <laughs> discussions with their professors so it's, a, it's I, I would say on a, on a group of 80 students if i have four students that come to me uh, at some point during the class to talk to me in the end 
hopefully it doesn't mean I'm a bad teacher, <laughs> but it's more like, I think it's a cultural thing that you have very few uh, discussions and even to look for internships or to look for uh, advice on what topic you they, they should be considering, what is currently booming, what is kind of like slowly dying. They, have, they, have, they, 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 they should, for me, interact with a lot more with their professors. And for me, it was like this. I mean, I think Andrew said that like having mentors was critical in his path. I think for me, it was also the case. Every decision I made at some point was inspired by a conversation by a professor or an older professor uh, at, when I was more advanced in my career or a colleague, a bit older uh, colleague would kind of advise me on what, what should I do. And, and, and for me, this is, this is clearly uh, uh, important. And, and when it comes to deep learning, I mean, also, I mean, if people send me an email, uh, I'm not saying that I should, end, I, I do answer all the emails I get, but I get most of them. And especially if there's, if the content is, is, uh, shows that there's a bit of thinking and, and, and planning and, and, and prior work. So if people reach out to me and say, oh, I've looked at what you're doing, or I've looked at this or this work, uh, and I'm curious, uh, uh, do you have any advice or what should I be doing? I would probably give you a piece of answer and ask you another question just to help you find your way. Uh, and I think it's people are, I mean, I, I get also all these random emails from people asking me, is there an open position in your lab? And I kind of option one is that, you know what my lab is doing? <laughs> option, two, <laughs> option two, I simply don't answer. Uh, and so this is for me one, one critical aspect. Uh, I think you, you, you can get a lot of insight from your professors if you make the first step and if you ask them questions, which shows that you've done a bit your homework. Yeah, and uh, just on that, uh, blanket emailing, maybe there is a, uh, there's a Monte Carlo way of shooting like that. But I think if you send an email that at least has shown that you've looked at the person's website and don't try to be generic saying, actually this one paper, don't try to talk about all their work saying, if there is one paper that interests you, you don't have to understand it. it kind of, there's a question later on is how much do I need to, if I'm going to a PhD, how much do I need to define the PhD? I personally think a PhD student shouldn't really know that much and they won't be defining their own question in the beginning uh, um, because a PhD is this conversation between the supervisor and, the, and only at the end. But at least saying that you have an interest in the area, that's where it comes in. But may, once again, different areas, different fields. So what about you, Eugenia? Like getting PhD students, giving advice for people looking for PhDs, what would you give them? Yeah. So yeah, there are different sources. Uh, we have connections to the universities surrounding our research facilities where we uh, either do workshops or sometimes teaching where we get in contact with uh, people. Uh, but we also have, well, supercomputing machine that is a continuous uh, source of attraction of a different kind of people who would like to work on it. Um, we have also different kind of programs that then make summer schools and uh, well, programs, internships, uh, where people go to the machine and do small projects where we can see how they perform basically. And whether uh, it, there may be that person among them who is um, then eligible to, 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 to do a larger project to, to go for a PhD track. Um, so, yeah, I mean, when you were mentioning the, the aspect of how to, how to, what, what, what demands would be, I mean, interest is a basic ingredient, of course. Um, but unfortunately, I have to say there has to be more. So that there, there has to be some skills, uh, because otherwise it, it will be a long and painful journey for both supervisor and PhD students. Um, so the, there is a certain level that we expect um, of, of some robust basic knowledge in machine learning and computer science in, in, in math uh, before we agree on uh, continuing the PhD journey. So we that's why we eagerly go with people into smaller projects to see how they are, uh, not to make it yeah, a suffering route for, for both sides. Um, and that's once again, you're finding your project. If you're an undergraduate, finding your project is a great uh, hook into something. Once again, like, uh, uh, and I know this is everyone in m and is currently doing uh, their project and they want answers. 
it's never about the answer. It's about the journey and what you learn along the way. And if you can show that when you're approaching someone saying, look, I did a final year project in this, nothing came from it, but I learned a lot and it engaged, you know, it's, it's once again, it's a step into these things. Um, it, it is so important and shown an interest in your, and yourself, Andrew, getting PhD students, looking for PhD students, like taking from the other side is so important. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I would just echo what Alex and, uh, has already been said. Yeah, yeah. You know, when you have a, um, when you receive a email, if you put yourself in the PI's shoes, what we want to hear is someone who is actually engaged with our research and wants to build on it, because that's what the PhD in, in our group would mean, right? Is you build on that specific PI's research agenda. So I think if you can be specific there, and um, also, uh, as John was saying, you do not need to read all of our papers. Don't expect that at all. But if you pick one and you say, you know, I found this particular paper interesting, um, then I, it's, I think that that would, would get you much further. And then, you know, in terms of um, what, yeah, I, I I, uh, I think in the PhD, you're, it's okay if you don't know what you're going to do. So you also don't need to say, I read this paper and I want to build directly on it. But it's more just showing that you're interested in the, in the area that, that PI is working on. And you have some interesting ideas there, even if they're not fully formed. And uh, then I think, I mean, I would uh, certainly try to respond to any emails like that I get. Yeah, I have PhD students who've never read, like PhD students who are my PhD students who have never read all uh, my papers or very few of them. Uh, and uh, when I mention some work I did, they always seem surprised, which part of me dies inside, but that's okay. Um, but knowing one area is good. Uh, and as I say, a PhD student uh, isn't meant to be a complete thing. There's a, just before I go, there's a conversation about what is a quality PhD, what's a good PhD. That's a really hard question to answer. Uh, and we'll come to that because it's what happens after the PhD is the big question, I think, in some levels. So, uh, Amita, yourself, um, what do you look for and how do you think people should look for PhD students? Well, when it comes to me, I would say when I have when I start looking up for my PhD student, the important thing is, again, like how much good that particular person is in terms of the interest in the field. So that becomes the first priority, definitely. And since my work is mainly into deep learning uh, and reinforcement learning, I prefer a person who has some knowledge of programming. So these are two important criteria, interest and knowledge of programming, which I think is important. Uh, for my particular perspective and as far as emails are concerned means it's a fact that if it is a general purpose email no one answers it means like there are so many of them but uh, yeah if uh, someone shows interest even if they have not read my paper but they have a genuine problem they are working on and they want some guidance or something like that definitely i reply yeah and so then following on from that so this is the because an academic career and so um your next thing is a postdoc or maybe not. And so how did everyone choose their postdocs? And now with their own PhD students, are you seeing your PhD students going to postdocs or are they going to academia uh, or into industry or what's happening now with yourselves? I can tell you, I chose my postdoc because I met a man in a bar. Uh, so that's not a good example. Um, uh, uh, but, uh, but then I met a man at a conference uh, and that also got me to another postdoc. But these are not good examples. Uh, they're my unique Irish way of doing things. Uh, Alex, by by yourself. Um, I, I mean, I, I'm not surprised by what you said. I think there's a lot of things that start with social interactions. Um, and so I would say definitely more so for the PhD postdoc level. For the uh, faculty level, it's very different. But definitely the early career personal interaction, I think, is so fundamental. Uh, so so my, my, I would say my grad students, I would say, surprisingly, at this point, maybe two thirds of academic positions um, or still and like in the academic process and kind of uh, uh, old postdocs that are really happy to be <laughs> senior postdocs because they have a lot of freedom to do what they want. Um, and the others are 
mostly working in the tech industry, uh, I would say, as research scientists or uh, software engineers. Um, and I guess it's most of them are, I mean, they, pretty much all of them have still a scientific oriented job. Uh, oh, yeah. So. No, and that, that's the thing is that the delineation of academia and industry is becoming very smeared um, in my mind. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, but like people in industry do research and people in academia, especially in deep learning. So, you know, it is a continuum. And maybe, maybe I would just wanted to, to react to uh, what something I was said in the chat, uh, which mm -hmm. is uh, find a, a postdoc or do a job where you will learn something. I think it's one of the, the, the driving thing. If, you, if, you, if you're excited about what you're, what you're learning, what you're doing, and, and you do it in an environment that allows you to explore this, then that's the, that's that's something that you will not regret. You will grow by by doing this. So find a a postdoc or a job in the industry where you, you will feel, or at least that's my conviction, my personal conviction. It's like what you will still be learning stuff. Um, and so it can be if you're like really fascinating about building big systems, ML systems. Probably industry is the right place to do it. If you are excited about fundamental scientific questions uh, and and this is what drives you, probably academia is still the right place to do these types of things. Um, but uh, it really depends on what what you find exciting. And, and again, coming to what you said we discussed before, if you approach, if somebody approached me to work in my team, I would like to know what what motivates uh, the person. And there was also this this uh, link that was shared in the chat was how to fail your PhD. And I don't know if there's one item that uh, resonates a lot for me is that don't see the PhD as a, another exam and uh, like school. Like PhD is a, a moment where you will be the actor of your own path. Uh, and so you need to find the topic where you're excited about the questions and not but not just about solving the problems um so yeah i couldn't agree more um failing a phd is kind of a rare thing if you get to the end but it can be an awful experience if you don't have an interest or a love of it or some ownership and that's exactly. that's a good phd yeah papers and everything there's too much chance a good phd is one that you felt you learned from and engaged mm -hmm. with yeah that it's it's a very it's like a piece of art you know it when you see it um uh but yeah paper two is nice but it's not essential uh do you know what by yeah. yourself like that transition yeah. to postdoc i i actually yeah i actually would like to comment a bit on uh alex um uh, pathways um uh statement so uh indeed in academia there are hard uh, times now for people who uh, would like to study large-scale machine learning because somewhat yeah Unfortunately, we didn't manage to um, gather that computer resources that are available and uh, industry labs, which then again, sometimes creates the self-amplifying um, circle of uh, bringing people in into industry labs who would like to study something on larger scale. But these things are, are, are slowly changing. So maybe you have heard about the big science initiative uh, in Paris. So the people who try to uh, gather research and industry labs around the state-funded supercomputing machines. And we do the same with a different uh, crowd that is a bit related to big science called Lion. So um, as a large scale artificial intelligence open network. So this is really a community of enthusiasts across different research labs and industry labs that try to do the same thing, that try to bring in back into academia the resources um, that are required to do actually large scale machine learning. And that can be also a good path for people interested in it who would like to stay in academia, both on PhD, well, actually all levels, a master, PhD, postdoc, um, because these initiatives are growing now. So I'm just going to paste one link at least here in the chat. Um, they self-organize themselves uh, with regard to which um, directions community considers to be the important to go in terms of large scale um, uh, deep learning. Uh, and then also apply together for grants uh, that uh, give them access to different kind of compute, either supercomputing facilities or uh, the things that are actually granted from industry players. 
so the, there may be, hopefully we will uh, hit back, the, the Empire strikes back, uh, the Academia strikes back and uh, get the um, um, opportunities for people who would like to do a large scale uh, machine learning research also in Academia frame, uh, not letting it all uh, to, to industry. Um, so this is the, the one comment. So for the postdoc transition, uh, the question was uh, how I felt. How you got there? And actually, um, because I'm going to roll in, or... <laughs> it's a kind of a two things. Uh, people are asking, how do you become interdisciplinary or slightly move aside? I was told at the end of my PhD, it's good to do something similar but different from your PhD. So well, um, yeah, actually, yeah. In my case, I was moving. Um, so I, I had all options. So I visited actually Google X and uh, uh, Mountain View. I went to San Diego for other companies. So I was actually scanning industry options and had some time reviewing those. Uh, in the end, it turned out for me that I'm not really the person for industry. So I, I uh, even in the most uh, freedom live loving uh, industry research labs, I discovered that uh, you don't have this kind of craziness that you have as a senior postdoc, for instance, that I was yeah, seeing in other people. So you can do whatever you like, uh, especially if you manage. So I mean, this is this. Is, okay, there are systematic problems in, in academia in Germany, at least, with all these uh, contracts that are non permanent. So there are definitely worrisome things happening in academia that, that should be done differently uh, but once you get a stability as a, um, a researcher so if you get a permanent contract for instance in Germany then you can follow up whatever you would like to do and uh, get the resources you would like to get and so it's um, for me it seemed a better take um, so I decided uh, for the academia path although I must say that this decision was bound also to negotiations with my um, uh, employee uh, where I was asking, especially for this, for having uh, some kind of a stability, so a permanent contract, for instance. So if I wouldn't be granted that, I'm not sure whether uh, I would have stayed in academia, honestly. Um, no, uh, so it's that funny uh, thing. A postdoc, senior postdoc is so free. They can do so much interesting work. It is the most stressful time in your life because if you don't have a permanent contract, so academically, I would say it was the most productive time of my life. Personally, um, I definitely would have, like it was not a pleasant time. And so that's the other thing about academia. But in reality, if you go into industry, you're always moving. It's just, it feels like there's a hard end in academia at the end of a postdoc. And that's something that can be, you have to be a certain personality type. That's why I never stayed in America. I couldn't stand the that system there, it seemed way more stressful in academia than in Ireland, where it's a bit more relaxed. I don't have to make a million a year in grants to keep my job, uh, you know. And so there are those things about choosing where you go as well. Um, Andrew, um, Kai, I'm going to ask you to kind of roll in because you have a, a bit of multidisciplinary uh, thing. Is in a postdoc or in a PhD, do you think transitioning to slightly different areas is important? Also, it seems that you should do more than four hours teaching because people like your uh, your your things, but um, uh, but um, so like that postdoc period, do you think that's where people should transition a bit and get other skill sets as well? And that's when you become truly multidisciplinary uh, in that thing, which is a good and a bad thing. I yeah, think. no, I think that is that is a, a good plan. That's a um, it's a period of time, like you said, where you have total freedom and you don't have to worry about funding at least for as long as that postdoc is. Um, so it's a time when I transitioned. I, my uh, postdoc was when I you know, was no longer in electrical engineering department, but was actually in a brain sciences department. Um, and I really loved the first few years of that. And just as you said, the last few years when I was trying to get a permanent job were not great. <laughs> it's, it's not a great time. It's a stressful time. Um, but uh, overall, I got the advice early on to um, lengthen that postdoc period because it is a period of such freedom. And I think I uh, don't regret that. I did have a wonderful time as postdoc. Yeah. yeah and, and once again, this interdisciplinary thing, like I moved into like Alex from a pure, uh, like a computational food dynamics degree into neuroscience. And 
it was certain aspects of that really excited me. So I really like, for example, Parkinson's. And that's why I do that research. If you find something that excites you, that's actually the fundamental thing of a postdoc period. And then moving forward, it impacts your own research questions. Uh, I find. Uh, Amita, yourself, you were a bit different. You st were straight into kind of a faculty position, was it, uh, from your... Yeah, so I joined faculty first, means like I became a faculty first uh, just after my master's. And it's only after I got my permanent position that I went for PhD. So my PhD was while I was in a permanent position. So I took a study leave and took, uh, got my PhD so that phase. And in India, normally we do not have uh, much of a, you know, option for a uh, postdoc in the sense I would not get another study leave to go for postdoc. And I'm already in the service. So there was no point of going into postdoc as well. And uh, yeah, we have a lot of freedom that phase if you are into teaching. So even before my PhD, I could have done a lot of research as I wanted, and I continued later as well. So that is definitely there. The funds are limited, but if you can work without funds, you have all the freedom. And that's a great thing about computation in your earth sciences. You don't need funding, yes. and you don't need a lab. Uh, yeah. uh, for, like, I definitely have found that, that uh, I, I collaborate with people uh, who have money and lab and things like that, uh, but um, being computational, you know, uh, and once again, this is maybe an Irish thing, but it, uh, School of Maths that I was in, uh, I'd never seen a postdoc in my whole life until I became a postdoc. Um, uh, but maths departments were very different. In the mid 90s in Ireland, if you finish a PhD, you'd just be offered a position in the university. There was no such thing as a postdoc back then. Uh, uh, so, like, these things are very location specific and time specific as well. You know, we can talk about our transition. I think we're all in the relatively similar trajectory that some ways were a lot easier back then. Um, like a lot of my colleagues would have started early on just straight into their full-time position. I would say a postdoc is a wonderful time to grow as a researcher. A lot of my colleagues who went straight into a permanent position, their research didn't continue because they didn't have the same bedrock of research or interest in research. So that's the other reason why postdoc is useful. But, you know, if you get an office of permanent position from your PhD, I take it though. <laughs> In my mind. So uh, we're coming up to the time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask a really broad question. Uh, and there's no right answer to this. Is, how do you picture academia for deep people in deep learning in the next five or 10 years? Uh, uh, I'm actually going to go in reverse order and start with uh, uh, Amita. It's such a big question. There's no answer, but I, I'm just curious. For a PhD and so forth, what do you picture the next five, 10 years for people in deep learning? Okay, so if I talk about coming five years, I think a lot of work has already happened in the field of computer vision. So people are moving into different directions, especially reinforcement learning. I'm that particular perspective. And like, for example, I'm also working up in the cognitive dissonance field and understanding how you know, the cognitive dissonance can be modeled with uh, deep learning. And I guess understanding of brain becomes an important issue, as like you have also have said, neuroscience and deep learning are kind of, uh, you know, complementing each other. So I guess that is a state and an explainable AI that I feel is one of the areas where a lot of research is going to happen in the coming years. And yourself, Andrew, how do you picture it, yeah. Also, I, this is a very personal answer. It's kind of what I pictured the next five years. So there's no yes. generic answer. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, I guess I think this it came up with the, the computing resources that we have. Like in academia, in my mind, um, probably we will have to do something a little different than just seeking scale in these giant models. I mean, uh, it would be great if we can do that in, in parts of academia, but, you know, I guess in my mind, um, building our mathematical toolkit for understanding these systems might lead to interesting new discoveries. Um, and another aspect of academia is its diversity. So, you know, you can really think about all of the world's knowledge in the university. Um, and in the industry research labs, uh, they're doing amazing things, but they often are more limited in their focus. And so, you know, we may see that um, on a much longer time scale, academia is where these, like the next deep learning scale uh, breakthrough is being incubated. Um, but it, that will come more through ideas and concepts, I guess would be my 
Uh, yeah, that seems to be uh, And Jania, you're kind of implying this already. This by academia pulling back from industry. Yeah, I mean, so of course, what what Andrew uh, says um, is um, a fair point that we need a way stronger theoretical understanding for what happens actually uh, not only at scale but in general if you drive um, algorithms that um, use for instance the standard toolkit of uh, 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 modern deep learning so what is what is so strange about the first order uh, um, stochastic gradient descent that it performs so well so it it, it all still um, is considered as a toolbox where people know it works, but why it works, it's not so quite uh, firmly established. So the th theoretical basis would be really nice to have in the future. On the other hand, I mean, it, reading also Richard Sutton's comment on uh, breakthroughs being always there when you invest compute, that 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 made some sense for me as well. So it seems that um, by increasing scale and investing uh, more and more into computation, well, into computational complexity of the model uh, brings up new functionalities and one have to study that as well. Um, I guess uh, bringing back studies at the sufficient scale in academia would be an important thing to do um, together with um, uh, theoretical establishing more theoretical foundations for what we see. Um, I mean, so I'm not I'm not quite sure how much of, of neuroscience went ever into deep learning. So, of course, we have uh, now deep learning networks as a tool to understand uh, different neuroscientific um, phenomena, for instance, analyzing visual cortex um, pathways in much better way. Uh, but the other way around, whether we ever built mechanisms into networks that are truly uh, uh, inspired by biological insight, I'm not sure. I hope this will come. So there are a lot of research on local plasticity, on um, local update rules that would give a way to a much more uh, efficient learning that we have now without the global break propagation, without all this huge machinery behind it to make it happen, without all this artificial IID assumptions on how do you actually learn from streams of data. So I think that will be another big breakthrough where we would manage to formulate uh, um, generic local losses uh, that uh, allow you to learn uh, completely asynchronously uh, and also give new ways to parallelize networks across conventional hardware, actually. But I hope there will be a better oh. hardware also coming that is executing those kind of things. And I guess this this is like on the very long term uh, what, I, what I'm very curious to see. So a new generation of algorithms that throw away back global backprop and rely on local learning rules, uh, which is the way how biology goes, right? Oh yeah, no, that'd be some interesting stuff. I, just because uh, like multi-sensory is the thing I love most. There was a lovely paper by a guy called uh, Ruben Ridu and uh, came out in TNS. And it's just about, he built a very simple neural network to do visual vestibular integration. And what blew me away about that paper was the nodes learned the same as what people have shown in single cell recordings for similar experiments. Uh, and yeah, I guess, there, yeah. I there guess, are some okay. examples, but the trouble is with that, that we, so because I'm coming from computational neuroscience, that was my trauma. We have a lot of <laughs> studies that, uh, especially maybe in rewards uh, driven learning, that was maybe the, the hallmark of how everything was seemingly fitting together. We have a lot of studies that uh, uh, do a parallel to uh, uh, experiments and show a resemblance. But if it comes to function, well, you don't have a robust function in most of these models. They, they all fail on uh, anything but toy tasks. So, and then right. we would like to, well, uh, yeah, maybe somebody has a counter example. Uh, no, no, so, no, I agree with you, but uh, that's okay uh, to, to be good at a toy task because our brain is just made up of loads of toy tasks. Well, anyway, not at all, <laughs> not at all, not at all, because we need to show generalization. So if you are, yeah showing something that works on toy test, you don't know anything about what this method can do. So if you show generalization capability, you know that you found something. If you don't, then actually that can be mm -hmm. anything just for a paper. Okay. Uh, yeah. right. uh, my That's personal take on it. Can I ask uh, uh, Alex? Uh, oh yeah, uh, Andrew, do you want to say something then I'll, I'll let Alex finish up. Oh yeah, I just wanted to say, so I, I think, you know, it's very common to say there's nothing in deep learning systems that is really drawn from biology, but um, 
I think there actually is. Uh, I think it's a complete success story of how this interdisciplinary project can work. So, you know, the, the fact that we use rectified linear neurons, in the fact that we call them neural networks, hints that's where they came from, and they really did come from there. Um, you know, the first deep systems were pioneered by psychologists. The first neuron models were pioneered by um, you know, Frank Rosenblatt, for instance. And uh, also a little known fact, which I, I feel like should be widely known, is that um, the nature paper that popularized backpropagation, you know, the workhorse algorithm that we all use, the first author is David Rummelhart, who's a psychologist. So yeah. in fact, Jeff Hinton yeah. was his postdoc. Right? Yes. <laughs> Uh, something yeah. that's not widely known. So it really is the case that there's a shared history. There is a definite shared. Involved, uh, deep learning. Yeah, there is shared history. So my doubts are just whether uh, those insights from neuroscience that a neuroscientist and psychologist had um, really went into the uh, working systems. I think it was rather another way around that people who were dealing with rather abstract notions were talking to psychologists in neuroscience and then were doing right. interdisciplinary project on that. They were kind of convincing them that abstracted away notions can have success and then uh, the common work was then success. So, but I mean, <laughs> rectified neurons, right? This, this is an arbitrary unit. So this is not really uh, no, I, I, so I, I, scientific I, I, and this, I, I think this will be the debate over the next five years, but I, I'd like to end uh, with Alex. Uh, what about yourself? What do you think the future will be? So, uh, for academia? If you, so well, if you, if you so if you step back, I would say a vision was the uh, had a, is 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 time in the like fifteen uh, uh, like ten to fifteen years ago, and then deep learning now, and you, you've seen the NLP revolution probably over the last three or four years. Speech is for me still uh, a very active field. Um, but uh, I would say these are kind of well-posed problems and um, where we know exactly what we want to solve, what task we want to, what object we want to, rec to, to uh, recognize or things like this. And, and, and so I'm more inclined to think that there's other stuff to do uh, and other types of ML problems and data problems that we could tackle with these types of tools. And this is probably also where academia has uh, a possibility to have to be the best in class on these types of topics because probably they are less mainstream that I'm thinking about things at the interface between deep learning and physics, for example, or things like uh, biosignal processing or like uh, doing deep learning on, on, on biosignals. Uh, Basically, when you move away from this mainstream deep learning topics, I think there's an opportunity to really develop uh, valuable uh, approaches. Um, and um, I'm, I, to be honest, I'm a bit pessimistic in terms of competes with uh, big companies on core vision or NLP problems. Uh, I think that's going to be really, uh, really tough. Uh, and of course, if you go towards more theory of, of, uh, of deep learning, if you are strong in math, then probably that's, uh, that's where you can have an impact. But uh, I would say if, if you, there's always a, a position in question is how do you position your research for the next five years and how do you put in a position so your problem is, input, is interesting and probably uh, you're in a good position to solve it. Uh, and I think academia is probably in a good position when you start to see deep learning at the interface with other sciences. There's many things to do, um, and um, or on the theory side. If if you if you, I mean, <laughs> probably I should not say that math is is a science in the sense that it, there's no experiments in there. But I would say deep learning and 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 uh, look, I was uh, that's a look look a long conversation. But uh, is math a science and 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 at least on, on the book, people would argue that it's it's not really a science in itself. It's uh, it's uh, <laughs> at least a science should is more thought as experimental sciences, and it sense math is not really uh, too much fitting into this uh, uh, box. But uh, joke aside, I think there's many things to do at the intersections with other disciplines that you can find in academia, whereas in industry you would be focused on one downstream task. Um, and for me, this is if you want to see things emerging, uh, on, on, and that's that's where I, I would expect things to happen in the next, next five years, especially in academia. 
Yeah, it, it, it's an impossible question to answer. But um, just on the local scale for the PhD students, what I say is, would say is, what skill sets do I need? Neuromatch Academy would be answer a lot of that. <laughs> it's a bit of self-advertising. But like, uh, as a mathematician, I would say maths. But I don't think people need a PhD in maths, but having competence and understanding of maths is, is so vital to uh, uh, be able to speak the language. Um, that's the one thing is uh, learning to work in the disciplinary, uh, disciplinary, and as you say, deep learning is going to touch every. I do not know of an area that deep learning is not going to touch. That's me paraphrasing Andrew, Andrew Ning. But to work with other people, you have to learn their language a bit. So if you are interested in super, uh collaborating or in areas at least learn the language don't come at the very end and say i can just do a network on that uh learn what they're trying to do and address um yeah coding and math is a fair summary so i don't know in which order but yeah yeah i think they're the same uh on some level um uh but that's just thing i would definitely say maths is a science definitely numerical analysis that the kind of math i was was I find an equation, I run the equation, I see what the answer is. I do not see a big difference. Uh, mm. Like my own computation neuroscience is mathematics, but I view the equations no different from someone who view the mouse model or a human in an experiment. But that's that's my sales pitch of what I do yeah. to people who don't do maths. <laughs> no, but I, I, so just to react on this real quick, I think it's it's you have the computer science and you have the math training that you also need to be interested in the application area. of these in the yeah. area and i think it was just said i'm just paraphrasing what was just said but for me hiring math or cs undergrad students and having them trying to tackle an interesting problem at the intersection between neuroscience and brain imaging and machine learning the gap for them to really embrace the the application problems can take a lot of time and it doesn't yeah. always work so no no i completely i couldn't agree more have an interest in the data don't mm -hmm. use the data as the last thing have an interest in the question that's how you become multidisciplinary if that's what you want to do um it's the only way you can be successful and talk to people and attend things listen to, and but anyway uh we've run over um <laughs> uh, i would like to thank our panelists who've been uh, great uh, and um, unfortunately, there's no right answer for any of these. But as I, I think the one thing we'd say is talk to people, reach out to people specifically when you're looking for PhDs, conferences, things like that. As you're when you're looking for postdocs, that's where you meet people. Scientists are vain and shallow. We'd like someone complimenting our work. If you do that, we'll definitely answer. Uh, so you know, uh, and there's not any scientists out there who should be uh who who wouldn't be excited by someone reaching out saying i'm interested in yours we met a lot of problem is we don't have the funding but you know that's not a no it's just uh, uh you know so forth but asking and being specific yeah uh, and um once again thanks and thanks to everyone thanks everyone bye bye See you. bye bye thanks for inviting bye bye yeah, it was my nice meeting everyone Ciao, ciao. Uh, I'm just going to answer one question since it's here. It's a, is it possible to fund my PhD by writing grants to a faculty member? Yes. I would say uh, most of my PhD students that I have have got their own funding, and it's a great way to start. But if you're in a bigger lab, they normally have funding as well. Um, different countries, different rules. Um, anyway, uh, and that's it. And thanks, everyone, for listening. <laughs>